Zhang Chorin is the first Bhutanese women writer to write a novel in English. She has published over 10 books since 1984. Kunzang Chorin shares about her life and reading culture in Bhutan. I was close to 10, so I had actually missed out my classmates, you know. They were in school since five. So four years gap I had, so I had to catch up on huh? And first learning the language, first le learning, the rec uh, learning to recognize the letters, then the words, to be able to read on my own, it took a long time. And I worked very hard because I was very, uh, in a way I was very ashamed that I couldn't read and all my classmates were reading. So first when I started reading, it was a burden because I had to read, I had to look up the dictionary meaning, I had to ask people how to even say the words and things like this. And uh, by age 9 or 10, my classmates were reading at a higher level than me and I was learning to spell, you know. So I did a lot of reading quietly on my own. I even went to the uh, extent of reading in my bed because I didn't want them to see me with uh, you know, books that were lower. So I read, I started with simple books of Naughty. Naughty. Mm. Yes. It didn't make sense to me, you know, Kuali Walk and what was this black boy doing and what were they talking about and all these toy things. But it was mainly for reading and getting the words and being able to read. So I started in a very, uh, started in a very laborious and very uh, challenging way. But finally I was able to catch up and then what? begin to really uh, learn and enjoy the books, yeah. What, what was your favorite book like as a child? As a child, we had to read some of the classics. I mean, I was not a child, I was already uh, pre-teen and we had to read the classics which were prescribed by the uh, curriculum. Um, so they were like, I read Emily Bronte, Charlotte Bronte, those were because, because of they were women writers and somehow I immediately related to them. But then we had to read stories from Charles Dickens and we had to do, it was compulsory to do the Shakespeare plays and things like this. So we had to learn the speeches and, and the way they were taught was uh, so enjoyable that you, you know, I can even remember at this age some of the most famous um, lines from uh, Merchant of Venice and uh, Julius Caesar and things like this because they just got imprinted. And the power of words was so important. I mean, it's sort of, uh, you felt you were rising to another level in your life, no? To be able to say, say these words and say it with a kind of a melody and things like this. So some of the books we had to read, which we learned to appreciate, some of the books we, which we liked. Mm -hmm. Yes, so was there any particular book that uh, inspired you? Um, I don't think there was one particular book that inspired me at that age, but later on, you know, now at this age, I think inspiration comes all the time from different books that you read. Um, just now I'm reading much more instructional books because at this age I say, oh, I'm writing and I don't have any instruction. So I'm reading one book called this, The Story and the Situation, which is about, uh, written by a woman who gives writing classes. Mm -hmm. And I find those very, very instructive, how to read, what, what to expect from writing, what is the story, what is the situation, how do you go about it. And especially um, the author you asked me, she's mm -hmm. Vivian Gonwick of Gonnick, Gonnick, mm -hmm. yeah. She writes, and uh, I'm especially interested in the part that she writes uh, about memoirs. Mm -hmm. Because I'm at this age, and stage in my life that I feel now I should write about myself. Yes. And one of the things that she says is, you can never teach anyone to write. It has mm -hmm. to come from within. Mm -hmm. You can nurture it, you can hone it, mm -hmm. your writing style and things like this. Mm -hmm. But the way you write, the writer is within you, you just have to awaken mm -hmm. that. Uh, since you're mentioning, you have read uh, so many of Bronte's works. Mm -hmm. And then I, I, when I read The Circle of Karma, I realized the character Somo. She mm. is uh, very independent, mm -hmm. very strong. Does Somo have some, some of the aspects of uh, being a feminist? At the time I wrote the book, I wasn't thinking in terms of being a feminist or being a voice for the women and things like this. But what was important is when I had my first draft, um, 
looked at by the owner of this Zuban company. And Zuban was actually one of the, it was a breakaway group. Uh, the Zuban actually began as Kali, Kali Publishers. And Kali was one of the first, it was in fact the first uh, woman's publishing house. And when I met the owner of Zuban, I, uh, her name is uh, Urvashi Putalaya. She told me, she, without looking at the book, she said, oh, it's about a woman and things like that. But I hope it's not one of those weepy women who accept everything and, you know, uh, feel like a victim. And I began to really think, I said, I don't want to bring another story about a weepy, defeated, hopeless woman. And uh, I think when I did the second draft, I did try to uh, make Tsomo stronger, more decisive, more confident, and more in control of the situation. No? She, so I think there was a conscious effort to make her not a victim of the situation, but in control and making her own decision. So how difficult uh, being a Bhutanese writer, how difficult is it to be published like, internationally? You know, there had not been any Bhutanese writers who had been published. And I think I was... Um, you know, sometimes you have to be rather naive to think that you can do things, and sometimes it's, uh, you get positive results, no? Mm -hmm. After I wrote Somo, mm -hmm. I thought I could get published. Mm -hmm. But there was nobody to talk with, mm -hmm. nobody to get advice. Have you published? Can you tell me how you go about? And I was too shy to go and ask uh, outside. So actually I bought a book. It's called All About Publishing. And that tells you how you do now, you've written your uh, draft, you send to this publishing, to, and then you get all the reject letters, and you get... So it was really a very lonely journey, because I had... First of all, my uh, manuscript had never been reviewed, because there were no forums, there were no groups who were interested to read. So it was only my family who read and critiqued or encouraged me. And uh, second of all, I had to make the journey on my own. So first thing I did was to write to this, all these uh, publishing houses. You know, I won't even mention the names because I'm so ashamed mm -hmm. to be so audacious, mm -hmm. think that I can get published. Mm -hmm. And uh, luckily I met, um, uh, you know, the Zuban, because they do uh, women's mm -hmm. works, that they were open to me. And I was very fortunate that year Penguin had asked this publishing uh, company, Zuban, that they will do every year two books collaborative. That um, Zuban will look for the manuscript and Pen it will be a joint. Mm -hmm. So that's how I got linked to Penguin. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I was just lucky. You know, I fumbled all the way mm -hmm. and uh, I found myself on the right path, you know. So sometimes it's everything just doesn't work like mm -hmm. clockwork. You fumble, you make mistakes, you make fool of yourself, but you reach a destination and that's how it happened. What would be your advice uh, to some of the aspiring writers who maybe who once, who, who are dreaming of publishing their works in the future? Mm -hmm. I think now since I've written the book, the time has passed and there's a lot, uh, the literary scene in Bhutan has matured quite a lot. Now there are groups of people who will edit for you uh, groups of people who will help you to, you know, we don't have writing mm -hmm. groups and things like this, but we are there enough people who will critique your book, who look, and I think that's what you have to do. Mm -hmm. You have to have your book, you know, many people think that just because they've written, you know, one draft and they think it's publishable. Mm -hmm. You know, a book needs a lot of attention. You have to, you have to get it, uh, uh, one of the basic things what's missing in Bhutan is good editing, mm -hmm. and we don't have editors here. Mm -hmm. Uh, nobody is a trained editor, and I think uh, it's um, very humbling for a writer to be told, oh, this sentence makes no, sen uh, no sense at all, or why do you bring in a character that has not been mentioned? All kind of constructive criticism you need, and you have to be able, you have to be uh, strong enough not to be feel hopeless that you can build on and write and write and write again and again. You know, you have to write several drafts till it's completely, you're completely f uh, happy with it. And then you give it to an editor and then they destroy your whole thing. And, you know, like for instance, chili and cheese. With my first editor, I couldn't. I could have never published the book because she was critical about everything. 
even my personal experiences she was critical of and I told the publisher I will not uh, uh, publish this book with her as the editor and I had to change the editor. So it's really, uh, you have to have the humility to take the criticism and you have to have the strength to go on. We are doing a survey, a very uh, simple survey on reading habits uh, of the students and then uh, it was quite uh, it amazing that most of the students they said uh, they prefer reading in English and most of them they preferred uh, reading fiction. Mm -hmm. So as an English writer yourself, what's your view on this? I think um, it's, it's understandable. It's understandable. Now when you say they prefer reading in English as compared to reading in Zonka. Mm -hmm. Now you have to look at the situation in a historical mm -hmm. way and Zonka as a written language is quite new. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think although we always had, mm -hmm. from ancient times, we had a literary wealth, mm -hmm. it was all about, um, not fiction, huh? mm -hmm. they didn't write fiction at all, they wrote mostly about biographies, about people, autobiographies, about mantras and tantras and all these kind of things, and things like this they wrote, and they, nothing was fiction. Mm -hmm. huh? so, I think human beings have a need to tell our stories and that is why we had a very uh, vibrant and a strong oral tradition where we told a lot of stories about ourselves, had good laughs about, our people, you know, about, about ourselves, criticized some of the institutions, but th that was all in the oral. And I think the people uh, wanting fiction rather than reading heavy biographies unless you're a scholar or you're a practitioner mm -hmm. is for enjoyment mm -hmm. no enjoyment as i said uh, uh, not having to read a book in the temple or not having to read a book now in the classroom mm -hmm. but something that you can enjoy and i think uh, that is uh, much um, has reached a uh, level in english that's accessible to all mm -hmm. whereas if you want to read uh, pecha, mm -hmm. you know, you have to read it in the in a reverent way. Mm -hmm. You have to read um, in the temple or in a respected form. Whereas you can read a, a fiction book on, you know, while you're walking, you're sitting, anything. Mm -hmm. And I can understand the children very well. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the zonka is developing. And uh, now most of the zonka writers, being bilingual, mm -hmm. so that they can read and write in Zonka and English, I think there will be a crossover when Zonka books and fiction also will become light and easy to read and uh, uh, as you were mentioning the word, I'm not saying it, but you mentioned the word lofty, yes. Zonka is no more a lofty uh, kind of a language, but it's an everyday language where people can relate and write about it without uh, without saying, oh, I'm using the biggest words and the big, biggest terminologies and the biggest ideas, but it's about every day. And that's what fiction is. I mean, so I think uh, it's really, really quite understandable. And then uh, most of the students were also mentioning that uh, I asked them, does your parents, uh, do your parents encourage you to read? Mm -hmm. And they're saying, yes, uh, they ask us to read just textbooks. They, uh, they're against uh, the children reading mm. uh, fiction. Mm. So do, do you feel like, um, are our parents uh, nurturing their children in the right way? See, that's, that's a very difficult question to answer. Now, if you look at the communities here mm. in Bumtang, mm. Tang Valley, okay, and then you're know, in a quite a remote area, mm. and there are two, three, four schools mm. here, mm. I really wonder if any of the parents mm. Are, except for the teachers and uh, maybe the civil servants who have read and have books in the house, I think the farm families don't have any books in the house mm -hmm. that they would read for pleasure or for leisure. Mm -hmm. They would have books which are pechas, mm -hmm. which are kept and revered. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if they can encourage the children to read what they don't know themselves. Huh? Mm -hmm. uh, of course, Chi, religion and sacred scriptures are the most important and that, that's how the parents will understand. But if you go and do a random survey in any house, you can do a whole village, you can take any house, they will have a television, 
they will have a lot of electrical gadgets like rice cookers and curry cookers and they will have the uh, hand blenders and quite a lot of electrical things. So they've invested in what they think is useful but they don't, you will see that they have no books because they don't yes. think really books are useful yes, to yes. them. No? And another thing why people don't invest in books, I think, mm -hmm. is because so far our education uh, system has mm -hmm. been so generous mm -hmm. that the government has been buying all the books. Mm -hmm. So the parents think, why should we invest mm -hmm. in books when it's provided for in the schools? Mm -hmm. So they have not taken on the responsibility of buying books mm -hmm. and uh, nurturing mm -hmm. the need for children to read, or in other words, uh, stimulating the love affair between yes. readers and uh, the, the books and the readers. Uh, I don't know if it's a generation gap, but uh, when we were younger, uh, we uh, used to uh, read classic books. I mean, we used to talk about, like among friends, we'll uh, talk about classic books, maybe Charles Dickens, or uh, we'll talk about Shakespeare, and then and then uh, we, I mean, uh, there was a charm like reading a book and then uh, the feel of the pages and then and now like uh, when I ask like my cousins or like younger generation what they read and most of them, they, uh, most of the students, in fact, they were mentioning youth, they were mentioning they read uh, Goosebumps. Mm -hmm. I think it's uh, American uh, uh, fiction, mm -hmm. uh, uh, horror fiction. Mm -hmm. So do, do you feel it's important to read classic books also? Is it uh, dying? <laughs> you can't say it's dying because now it's just the way of reading and the way books are available to you now. I mean, I'm much older than you and you're already talking about a generation gap. In the, at the time when I was learning to read and enjoying read, I mean, we couldn't imagine that one day you would have a small little smartphone in your hand and you would read it and there's so many programs now that you can actually Kindle. read books, yes, Kindle. And, um, you know, we didn't read, in my childhood, I don't think we read classics because we thought they were prestigious to read classics, because those were the books that were available to you. If you went into the library, these were the books. And um, somebody would talk about a book and say, oh, you should read this book, but we were not forced to read any of the library books unless it was uh, part of the curriculum, then we had to do it. Like for instance, of course, I think every uh, English class you read some of the liter uh, classics. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I feel it is important. I feel, for instance, as a writer now, mm -hmm. I should have studied English language. Mm -hmm. I would have known all the classics mm -hmm. and things like this. But then on the other hand, I say, you know, these things are to talk about and make reference to, oh, remember Charles Dickens in his book like yes, this. Yes. But what difference would it make mm -hmm. to me to write about uh, today's Bhutan mm -hmm. from the point of view of the classics? Of yes, course, yes. the language gets richer. Mm -hmm. It's much more in-depth mm -hmm. and things like mm -hmm. this, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. And you would know the methods and you would know the character. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to write about what you feel deep inside or what you observe, mm -hmm. I think uh, it's not really necessary to read the mm -hmm. classics or because I missed re reading uh, many of the classics, maybe that's why I, that's how I rationalize. Mm -hmm. But I don't think you should put off a potential reader or a writer by saying you should first read Shakespeare or you should first read uh, uh, Charles Dickens. Mm -hmm. You read what you enjoy. Mm -hmm. And I think even now people look down and say, oh, our children are not reading, they're only on Facebook, and, mm -hmm. but they are actually reading. Mm -hmm. And they're reading what is, uh, um, what is the popular language, everyday language. No, maybe they will not be able to write fanciful, mm -hmm. classical language, but they are communicating and they are mm -hmm. listening to what the communication they're reading. So I think it's very difficult to judge a period of time based on another period, you know, 18th century, 19th century, they read these great books and, you know, did you read War and Peace and things like that? No, no, you read. I think it's all right. I think it's all right. But it's important of, because every person who reads does not become a writer. And reading is about enjoyment. And writing, I think, is something that comes out from deep inside. And uh, uh, just, I'm reading... Um, a book, um, the story and the situation, mm -hmm. and it's uh, giving instructions or it's telling us her experience mm -hmm. of teaching mm -hmm. 
to, uh, read, uh, writing classes and she said, you cannot make anyone to become a writer unless there is something in you that can be tapped and nurtured and honed. And I think that's what I believe. Uh, now that you have retired, Mola, like to, uh, you are back to your hometown, mm -hmm. how do you describe your life here now? It's, um, you know, I had uh, quite a idealistic idea in retirement. I'll just read, write, do my garden. But I didn't realize all the realities that exist. We are we're doing a lot of construction, a lot of renovation. I'm very busy with the museum. So reading, writing is a little bit... Uh, um, not really satisfactory, but I because I am distracted with all these things. But eventually, I know that I will have a time when I was just reading, writing, doing my gardening, going for walks. That's how I imagined um, retirement would be. I never imagined that retirement would be so busy. <laughs> And then uh, I believe like once you uh, become a writer, you mm -hmm. can't like uh, stop writing the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. So you must be having uh, some, uh, what is your ne next work? Now? I'm, um, I've been, well, publication, I don't know whether, whether, whether it will ever be published, but I've been for some years now writing about my childhood, mm -hmm. about the situation and the stories and the people here. So I guess it will come into what what uh, people will say is a memoir. Mm -hmm. And I'm at this age when I can actually sit back and try to recall mm -hmm. without rancor or regret what I lived through, just to record it. Because not only for myself, it is important for myself to go through my life and how I lived my life. But I think, I hope it will also be important for people, who, if it ever gets published, to read about what has changed in the last 50, 60 years? And what was Bhutan? What were the systems? What were the people thinking of? Uh, how they thought, how they perceived, and what we have come to now. So you're writing a memoir? Yes, I'm it's kind a of a memoir, I guess. It's a kind of a memoir, but just really recording my uh, life and the changes that I've been through. So I'll really be looking forward to that book. Thank you very much. I haven't, uh, I haven't got a name as yet, but I have a... Uh, working title, it's called The Fragments. The fragments. Uh, the, fragments. It's just fragments because it's just, it's not a chronological, I was born and so and so and at this age, it's just bits and pieces of my life as I remember under different circumstances. Yeah. I'm sure it will be a great book. Thank you very much.